In this video, I'll discuss Regulation FD and why it's important for outside investors. Then I'll discuss what certain brokers do for their clients. After that, I'll show you how to trade securities in the real world. And then finally, I'll discuss day trading and why you should never do it. Regulation or Reg FD is also known as the Fair Disclosure Rule. This rule requires value relevant information of the firm to be disclosed simultaneously to investment professionals and the public via press releases or SEC filings. If a firm has quarterly earnings to report, it has to disclose those quarterly earnings publicly to everyone at the same time. If the firm's CFO is resigning, the firm must disclose that publicly to everyone at the same time. Conference calls discussing the firm's quarterly earnings, called earnings calls, are open to the public, and you can get transcripts of them on the Bloomberg Terminal. The purpose of Reg FD is to ensure that every investor has the same information about the firm. This means that no one should be able to profit from insider trading. The better your analysis, the better you should be at picking stocks, and the higher the return on your portfolio should be. The idea that more analysis of publicly available information will give you a more accurate valuation of the firm's stock is captured by mosaic theory. Mosaic theory is the theory that the more public information you can piece together, the more informed your recommendations as an analyst will be. If you've ever heard Warren Buffett discuss his strategy as a value investor, you'll know he subscribes to this theory. He and most value investors read everything they can about a firm, its industry, and the market conditions around the firm, because doing this allows them to accurately assess the firm and its prospects. Now let's talk about brokers, or specifically stock brokers. Brokers are intermediaries between buyers and sellers of securities. They make the process of buying and selling securities easier for their clients. If you're a client of a broker, your broker will either sell you their shares when you want to buy a stock, or they'll send your order to the exchange so it can be filled by another investor or broker. Most brokers you or I will use will grant you access to their alternative trading system, like TD Ameritrade's Thinkorswim platform. Now, when you purchase securities through a broker, those securities are held in street name, meaning that officially the broker's name is on them, but the broker is just holding them for you. There are several types of brokerage accounts you can open. As an individual, you can open an individual account. Until I got married, I had two individual accounts with two different brokers. Once I got married, I opened a joint account with my wife. Joint accounts allow both parties to access the funds. A custodial account is an account of a minor that requires a parent or guardian to be involved in all transactions. These are great if you want a teenager to learn about investing. Your account can be either a cash account or a margin account. A cash account only allows you to invest the capital you contributed to your account. A margin account is more difficult to obtain since this account allows you to buy on margin through your broker. Usually, you can specify what kind of account you want when you initially contact a new broker. For example, both of my individual brokerage accounts were margin accounts since I occasionally like to engage in short trades and invest in assets like currency and futures. Having a margin account is necessary if you want to make any of these trades. There are two broad categories of brokers, full service and discount brokers. Full service brokers will give you greater access to the markets and are more likely to help you purchase shares of IPOs. They'll also often give you advice on what to buy and sell. However, there's an agency cost to choosing this type of broker. Full service brokers often charge fees that are a percentage of the assets they're trading on your behalf. This means that they have the incentive to get you to buy and sell more than you otherwise would, simply to increase their compensation. This is called churning, and it's a well-known phenomenon in the brokerage industry. Discount brokers, on the other hand, will often charge you at most a flat fee per trade. In 2019, most of the large discount brokers stopped charging their clients any fee for stock trades. However, they still charge fees on options and trades of other securities. As time goes on, more of these discount brokers are offering research reports to their clients. For example, 
E-Trade and TD Ameritrade both offer research reports on most stocks with market caps above $100 million in the U.S. These brokers also give you access to their trading platform, which is an alternative trading system or ECN. That platform allows you to conduct your own analysis. Here's a list of brokers by type. Some of the biggest banks in the U.S. are full-service brokers and have been since the passage of the Financial Services Modernization Act in the 1990s. I mentioned that act in the last section. I've listed some of the more popular discount brokers in the second column. I actually recommend that as a student in my class, you actually open a brokerage account with one of the discount brokers in this second column. Right now, my brokers are Fidelity and E-Trade, although I still have an unfunded TD Ameritrade account. It's free to open a brokerage account with a discount broker. You don't have to have any funds in the account until you're ready to actually start trading. My recommendation for new investors who want a lot of functionality and they want to engage in technical analysis is to open a TD Ameritrade account since it gives you access to both their Think or Swim platform and paper trading, which means that you can make trades using fake money in real time. Another good option is E-Trade because of their research reports. Personally, E-Trade's my favorite. Now let's talk about trading costs. There are two big trading costs you should know about, commissions and the bid-ask spread. The commission is the fee you pay to your broker so they'll process your order to buy or sell assets. It's the explicit cost of trading. Brokers are perpetually trying to undercut one another and have been lowering fees for years. As I mentioned earlier, E-Trade, TD Ameritrade, and other brokers stopped charging commissions for stock trades in 2019. However, they still charge for trades of options and other securities. You'll usually pay a flat fee for options trades. Now, the bid-ask spread is another cost of trade. However, this is an implicit cost. A spread, like the bid-ask spread, is the difference between two numbers. The bid-ask spread, as its name implies, is the difference between the lowest asking price for a stock and the highest bid price for a stock. So, what are these? Well, the bid price is the highest current offer to purchase shares of a given security. The asking price, or the ask price, is the lowest current offer to sell those shares of a given security. Both of these orders have not been filled yet. They are, as we say, open orders. The spread is the asking price minus the bid price. Let's take a look at this with an example. In this example, we're looking at all of the bids submitted by investors using limit buy orders and all the limit sell orders. The numbers in the first column represent the open buy orders, or orders where an investor has offered to buy shares for no more than a specific bid price. The second column details open sell orders, where investors have specified they're willing to sell their shares at no less than the stated price. The final column details the number of shares specified. Right now, the highest bid price in this example is for $221.11, and the lowest asking price is $221.25. The difference between them, or bid-ask spread, is $0.14. Cents. If you wanted to buy shares of Apple stock immediately, you would need to offer at least $221.25 to buy your first 200 shares. After that, you would need to pay $221.33 to buy your next 100 shares. If you wanted to sell all of your shares immediately, you would need to sell the first 30 shares for $221 or less. After that, you could only sell the next 40 for $221.08. Notice here that the spread is fairly low at $0.14. Cents. For context, the spread on some shares like the Berkshire Hathaway Class A shares can be in the thousands of dollars or even represent 5% or more of the value of the security, particularly in emerging markets. When there's a very wide spread, this means that the market for that stock is illiquid. If you wanted to buy that stock quickly, you'd have to pay a premium above what that stock is probably worth. 
Apple's shares in this example appear to be pretty liquid. In other words, there's a negative relationship between the size of the spread and the liquidity of the stock. Let's take a look at the spread of Apple in the real world now. All right, so I'm on Yahoo Finance and I've got Apple pulled up here. And some of the basic information we have just comes on the summary page or the summary tab of Apple. And right here are the bid and ask prices. These correspond to the highest bid and the lowest asking prices for shares of Apple. So right now the highest bid price for shares of Apple is $384.92. And that investor is willing to buy 800 shares. The lowest asking price is $384.99, and that investor is willing to sell 1,100 shares. All right, now, what happens if someone offers to pay $221.25 to buy the 200 shares in this, this fictitious example? Well, what is going to end up happening is if someone's willing to pay the lowest asking price immediately, those shares are going to be sold to that, that investor. And what will end up happening is now the lowest asking price is this 221.33 for 100 shares. And our spread has actually increased to 22 cents. So 221.33 minus 221.11. There are many types of orders you can use to buy and sell securities. I've listed five of the most common here. The simplest is a market order. A market order tells your broker you want to either buy or sell a set number of shares for the best price you can get. If you're buying shares, you want to buy for the lowest price you can get for each share. If you're selling shares, you want to sell at the highest price you can get. The next orders we have are the ones I've already mentioned, limit buy and limit sell orders. A limit buy order is an order that tells your broker you only want to buy shares at or below a specific price. A limit sell order tells your broker you want to sell shares at or above a certain price. Stop loss orders tell your broker you want to sell your shares of a stock if it falls to a certain price. This type of order keeps you from holding on to stocks whose share price is tanking. Stop buy orders are used when you suspect the price of the shares will increase rapidly. You tell your broker to buy those shares of the stock if it reaches a certain price. All right, let's try an example. So let's say you want to sell 200 shares using market orders. How much would you receive? Well, remember, you want to sell your shares for as much as you could possibly get. And a market order tells your broker to sell your shares at the best possible price. Well, in this case, if you wanted to sell 100 shares, you could get $9.00. And if you wanted to sell another 100 shares after that, you could get $8. So in this case, the maximum you could receive for selling 200 of the shares that you own right now would be $9 times those 100 shares plus $8 times the next 100 shares, or $1,700. Answer is D. All right, now let's talk about how you actually trade securities in the real world. Well, the first step is going to be to open a brokerage account. I've opened many in my day. I think most of the big brokerage houses probably have my information. As I've mentioned, I currently have an E-Trade and a TD Ameritrade, or sorry, a Fidelity account, although I do have an unfunded TD Ameritrade account. It's very easy to open a brokerage account. If you're a U.S. citizen, you just go online to the broker you want, submit your information, and usually at most within a couple of days, they're going to give you your account. As I've mentioned earlier, I actually recommend E-Trade. They have very low fees on options, and they also offer free research reports. The next step in this process is to fund your account, aka transfer some cash to it. This is usually done using an ACH transfer. Basically, if you have a checking account, you link the two, and then you just transfer however much money you want to invest. And it's as simple as that. I mean, the first time you set that link up might take a couple of days, but after that, the transfer usually takes at most 24 to 48 hours. The next step in this process is to follow the steps that I gave you for investing all the way back in our first section. I gave you a list of 
steps like identifying your assets, identifying goals, identifying risk tolerance, etc. So if you want to know what to do, go and see that and certainly we'll we'll talk more about how to actually invest later in this class as we talk about stock track. The fourth point I want to make here and it's an incredibly important point is as a an individual investor do not day trade. I cannot stress that enough. Do not day trade as an individual investor. Do not buy shares at the start of the day and then sell them at the end of the day. All right, so I'm pretty sure everyone who's watching this video already knows what a day trader does, but if you don't, day traders buy and sell stocks over the course of a day or maybe a couple of days in the hopes of cashing in when the share price rises or falls. The problem with day trading is that it's extremely risky due to the volatile nature of stock prices. There are infinitely many moving parts and pieces of relevant information that can affect the price of a stock, which means your ability to predict stock prices in the next week is going to be really low. As you'll see in later videos, the R squared or explanatory power for even our best models in investments to predict the daily stock returns is lower than 10%. In other words, even with the best models, we don't have a good way to predict stock returns over a very short amount of time. In addition to the unpredictability of stock prices, as a retail investor, you're competing against investors that have better analytical tools and data sets than you ever will. For example, a couple of years ago, it was announced that a hedge fund was using cameras in mall parking lots to determine the number of cars and therefore the total traffic inside the large retail stores in those malls, like Macy's. Other institutional investors also farm out a large amount of analytical work to teams of analysts, both in the U.S. and overseas. The trading models used nowadays are extremely complex and high frequency traders ensure you won't be the first person to trade on a new piece of information. Although trading fees on stocks are extremely low, you're fighting an uphill battle as an individual day trader. All right, let's go ahead and recap. So I've talked about Reg FD at the start of this video and Reg FD indicates that value relevant information has to be made available publicly to everyone at the same time. That means that the retail investor that has no majority stake in the company should get access to new information of the firm or about the firm at the same time as the major institutional investors of the, the own shares of the firm. Next, we talked about full service and discount brokers. Most of you who open brokerage accounts are probably going to open a discount brokerage account initially. And we talked about the bid ask spread and how it's a measure of market liquidity. Essentially, the smaller the bid ask spread, the more liquid the market. Finally, I did touch on day trading and how you should never do it. I, I promise you there's all kinds of academic information to back this up. Don't ever day trade. You are competing against investors that have far more experience and tools at their disposal. All right, so with that, I am going to wrap up. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. If you don't, well, I suppose I'll see you on the next video.